Great. Uh, thanks, Kim. Uh, you have stolen my thunder a wee bit. So, um, as you can see from my title, I took the Inchstones to Milestones tagline because I thought it was very, um, just a really good way of thinking about how research happens. In terms of uh, what the public gets to hear about and see, you hear about those big milestones, but you often don't hear about the work that leads up to them. So it's not often I get sucked in by marketing, but I think they got, got me this time. Um, I also just wanted to take a minute to consider when we give talks like this, when we pitch our ideas to funding agencies, we present it in this sort of format. Step one log logically leads on to two, three, four, and then our milestones at the end. Um, it's probably not too much of a stretch of your imagination to realise that reality actually looks a little more like this. <laughs> our forward uh, momentum isn't on the straight and narrow. Uh, we tend to zigzag our way forward, we loop back and start again. Sometimes there may even be just dead ends where we have to stop and reconsider what we're doing. Um, and it, obviously the gains in knowledge, they're not uniform in size and shape or impact. They aren't just about the biology of how the brain works. They can be advances in technology, development of new methodologies, which obviously help us get through those roadblocks that may have been there for decades. So here uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about Parkinson's. And in my title, I talked about the ultimate milestone. And I think you'll all agree that that is probably a cure. So in the uh, context of Parkinson's, what might that cure look like? Um, first of all, I think we need to consider what Parkinson's is. So we describe it as a progressive neurodegenerative disorder, which is a bit of a tongue twister. But progressive meaning that it continues, it spreads throughout the brain, okay? And then neurodegenerative meaning we are losing function and also structure within different areas of the brain. So what might a cure look like? Well, I think it can probably come in at least two, two kind of um, parts, which are actually quite separate and will be, I think, achieved at quite different times. So first of all, the cure might be some way of stopping that progression. So can we stop the pathological process that's happening in the brain so that no more destruction is occurring? And then some people might actually, maybe that's not enough for them, maybe they want to regain function that's lost. So I think that the second part of a cure might be, can we replace um, the function of the brain uh, that we've lost and then we, can we regain function back? Um, those two uh, aspects of a cure would be um, sort of reached at very different times because they're very different sort of lines of research but perhaps the ultimate milestone being the cure would be those two together. Um, and what I thought I would do for tonight's talk is just identify uh, what I think are three challenges that the field of Parkinson's um, is facing and just talk through uh, things that have been done and where we're at in terms of solving those challenges. They're not new challenges. They've been there since day dot. It's just we haven't actually sorted them out yet. So Parkinson's disease, um, uh, the early descriptions are largely down to these two guys here. So obviously at the top there we've got James Parkinson. So he was the one who's attributed with the first description of what he called the shaking palsy back um, to, uh, about 210 years ago. Um, and so he described, you know, six, six people that he knew, three of them were his patients, um, three were people that he'd met on the street, uh, and described in a lot of detail the, the types of symptoms that they had. Um, and at the bottom we've got um, Jean Martin Charcot, who's a French neurologist. Um, he's basically, modern neurology is attributed to him, and his name, Charcot, um, features, I think it's in about 36 different disorders. So he was a busy man back in the day um, describing um, neurological conditions. So the one of the main features of Parkinson's is movement. It's, it's classified as a movement disorder. So there are deficits in movement. And there are three key movements which are considered at the time of diagnosis. So they are bradykinesia, which is um, a term to help describe the slowing of movements. Um, and we often use a finger tapping task to demonstrate this. And it's not just the slowing of that 
movement, but also a reduced amplitude of the movement, and also people with Parkinson's may have trouble maintaining an even rhythm of the movement. There's also rigidity, so that's a stiffness in the muscles, um, and that's quite easily um, assessed just through um, rotating the arm, so moving both the, the wrist joint and also the elbow joint. And then, of course, there's the tremor, which is probably the um, most well-known um, motor feature, and that is generally um, a resting tremor, so once someone gets going and starts doing something, that tremor um, will um, drop back. So these three um, symptoms are considered at diagnosis, so you need to have bradykinesia, and you need to have one of the other two, so either rigidity or tremor, to get a diagnosis. There's also postural instability, so people tend to get um, <clears throat> start having trouble keeping themselves um, upright, um, and that's when things like falling becomes a problem, and also there's obviously um, disorders of gait or the walking cycle. Um, and in fact, the reduced arm movement, which is often seen, um, can be sometimes the first sign that people pick up that something's wrong. It's not just a motor disorder, though. This is just um, a list of some of the common non-motor symptoms which we now accept as part of Parkinson's disease. And as you can see, it's not restricted to one aspect of life. In fact, it's really just um, affecting all, all aspects of our function. So when um, someone goes for a diagnosis, um, not only will they get their motor assessment or their movements assessed by the doctor, there will also be um, a medical history um, where things like um, these non-motor symptoms will be covered off as well. Okay, so the challenge number one. Why does someone get Parkinson's disease? Now, if we know this, we may, in the future, be able to target their treatment, to make sure that they're getting a treatment which we know is going to work for them. We're not there yet, um, but we do hope that in the future we'll be at that stage. Um, the other thing, too, is that if we know why someone's getting it, we can then actually provide really good public health information on things to avoid and things to do to keep yourself healthy. OK, so... Many, many years of research in many different countries, um, we've come up with a list of things that we think are what we call risk factors. The greatest risk factor is age. So it can affect anyone of any age, but the older you get, the more likely you are to have a diagnosis. And this little graph here is data that we generated from the New Zealand population, and it just shows the incidence, so that's the number of people with a new diagnosis, um, by age, um, and our age here goes from 20 up to 100. Um, and what you might be able to see is that around about age 50, that line is definitely up off zero, and then it gets quite steep between the 60 and 85 age groups. So that's when the bulk of the people are going to receive their diagnosis, and on average in New Zealand, it's around about 72 or 73 years old. There is a key thing there, it drops off quite a lot after 85. It doesn't mean if you reach 85 and you haven't got Parkinson's that you're not going to get it, but your chances of getting that seem to be reduced. We're not entirely sure why that is yet. That's something that we're continuing to look into. Risk factor number two, being male. However, this doesn't actually hold up in all populations. Most populations this holds up, but there are some where there is very little difference between the proportion of males and females that get it, um, and some populations or studies that have even reported higher rates in females. Um, so that in itself suggests that maybe it's not biology that's, that's um, contributing here, maybe it's more environmental. But on average, uh, in a place like New Zealand, you'd expect twice as many males to get Parkinson's than females. And the other thing is genetics. So we know that genes are playing a role um, in Parkinson's, even though it's described as idiopathic, which basically means of unknown cause. Um, we do know that genetics uh, is playing a role, and I'm just going to... I don't want you to worry too much about the details of the slide, but it's a nice way of thinking about how genes can actually influence what's going on. So along the horizontal here, 
we have how common the mutation is in the population. And when I say population, we're talking the population as a whole. And up the vertical, we have its impact. So how likely is it to cause the disorder? So this group at the top are genes where we have mutations which are very rare, but they alone can actually cause Parkinson's disease. So we know that around about 10% of the cases will be what we call monogenic or related to a single mutation in a single gene. They tend to cluster within families, um, and that's how most of these genes or mutations have been discovered over time. These two in the middle, GBA and LARP2, they're relatively uncommon, and they have a medium effect. So what, what we say is that they can significantly increase your chance of getting the disorder, but alone they cannot cause the disorder. So there must be something else going on that tips you over the edge. And this group here in the blue circle, these are common variations that we all have in our genome. Um, and after many, many studies with thousands and thousands of people, they've been shown to be, these variations have been shown to be more common in people with Parkinson's than people without. Um, and they're described as increasing the risk, but only by a tiny little bit each. But the additive effect of all of those is likely to, um, to tip some people over the edge as well, or make them more susceptible to other factors, if you like. The eagle-eyed few of you in the crowd may have noticed that some of them actually appear on that graph twice. I'm just going to pick one out. So SNCA uh, is up here. There's a mutation in that gene that causes it. It's also down here. So there's a different mutation in that gene which doesn't cause it, but is actually contributing to the risk of developing it. Okay. And aside from um, those factors, there's also things I've alluded to already, the environmental exposures. So, again, many, many years of research across many different countries, things like rural living, farming, well water consumption seem to be more common in people with Parkinson's. Now, those are all interrelated, right? If you're drinking out of a well, you're probably living rurally. If you're living rurally, you're probably farming. So we don't quite know exactly what it is. But there's also things like pesticides. So um, the evidence for paraquat is probably uh, the most reliable. But again, if you're being uh, exposed to pesticides, you're probably living rurally, which farming, and you're probably drinking well water, and pesticides can leach into the groundwater. So what we haven't really been able to establish is exactly how that all happens. We're just assuming that that's probably what's happening because often there's not really good data in terms of um, water quality if you're drinking from your own well and things like that. There's also um, things like uh, solvents and TCE is the one that's been talked about a lot, particularly in the last few years. Um, it seems to seems to increase your chance of, of getting Parkinson's quite substantially. But again, what proportion of the population has been exposed to any one of these um, you know, exposures is, is still to be determined. We don't really understand that so well. So you know, just, throughout the talk, I'm just going to highlight some work that we've done or we're doing um, in different areas. And so we have a study underway at the moment um, called the New Zealand Parkinson's Environment and Gene Study. And what we're hoping to do is to really establish which of those risk factors are at play in New Zealand. This is the team in the corner. But what we're hoping to get from people is detailed work and residential histories. So often it's hard to establish what people have been exposed to, but if you know what jobs that person has had throughout their lives, through that, the job title, we can usually infer what sort of exposure they've had. We're asking lots of questions about different lifestyle factors, uh, medical history, and we're also collecting DNA because what we want to try and do is we want to try and join that environmental exposure and the genetics together because we know not everyone exposed to pesticides goes on to get Parkinson's disease. Uh, and likewise, someone who might have a relatively high genetic risk for Parkinson's may not develop it. So there's got to be some sort of interplay between the two um, that is putting people on the course towards Parkinson's. 
Um, so it's a nationwide recruitment. Sorry, I'm just going to wiggle my earpiece. Um, nationwide recruitment, which is a new endeavour for us. We do a lot of face-to-face -face research here in Christchurch. Um, but for this to get the numbers um, and to get some good quality data, we really needed to reach out across the country. Um, most of the data collection is done online. Um, that's the website there. If anyone in the audience thinks they might be interested or knows someone who might be interested, um, I do have some broch brochures here too, so feel free to come and grab one um, afterwards. Um, that's funded by the Health Research Council. Um, um, and we would be happy to take anyone who's keen to give it a go. We've also done some work um, on that GBA gene. That was one of the ones in the middle on that, in that plot that I showed you before. Um, and this one's really interesting. Um, we've teamed up with some local geneticists, so Martin Kennedy and, and Oscar um, Graham. Oscar did this as part of his PhD. And they really came at it because it, it's a technical challenge for them. So GBA has what we call a pseudogene. So it's another segment of the DNA which is very close to it and has a very similar sequence. So when we use the old sort of technology for sequencing genes, it was sometimes it was difficult to tell if you were getting the gene sequence or the pseudogene sequence. So what Oscar did is he applied a new technology um, which gave us more certainty that we were definitely getting the GBA gene. Um, and he sequenced our local research um, cohort here in Christchurch and he discovered that 10% of our cohort had mutations in that gene. And that's about on par with other studies from around the world in populations that are predominantly European ancestry. Some populations have up to 30%, so that's a, just a really good indication that these genetic risk factors actually um, vary between different populations. Um, Oscar then went on, so mutate, identifying mutations is good, but then you've, you've got the mutation or you don't, and often got the mutations a small group, because it's only 10% of of the people. Um, but what Oscar did do is he looked at what we call a haplotype. I don't even know what that is myself. In general, instead of just saying I'm looking for one mutation, it's basically saying I'm going to look at a range of, of positions within this gene and then I'm going to group people together depending on what their sequence is at lots of different um, locations and these are, so these are called haplotype groups and he's managed to divide everyone into three groups and what we're able to show here is that when we look at diagnosis age and age of symptom onset it seems that there's a difference between these three groups and so haplotype group three are on average younger when their symptoms start and get their diagnosis than haplotype group one. So even in the absence of a mutation, there's variation in how people, um, you know, the genetic sequence of this gene is influence, influencing when people get a diagnosis or an onset of the disorder. Um, so that was um, quite good, and we, um, we're doing some more work now to, to try and look into that a little bit further. Um, we are expecting um, some really big gains in knowledge around the genetic influences of Parkinson's in the next few years, and it's really due to this um, initiative, which is the Global Parkinson's Genetics Programme. Um, so they've got the lofty goal of genotyping, or sequencing if you like, 150,000 people from across the globe. And it's no mean feat. This is the, the world map from their um, website, which um, shows all the, the countries that are involved. Um, hopefully you can see New Zealand down here. You won't be able to read it. It's got a wee three on it. So there's three groups in New Zealand that are registered. Um, I say three groups. Two, two of the cohorts are ours. So it's, it's mainly us. <laughs> Um, but it really does just make sure that we're contributing to international um, efforts to try and advance our knowledge. And the bonus is, is that they do all the hard work for us and then we get the data back. Um, it's funded originally through the Aligning Science Across Parkinson's um, group and then Michael J. Fox of um, Foundation have come in later on. So those two um, groups there are philanthropic um, funders of Parkinson's research. They're both based in the US, but the great thing is, is that they accept applications from groups all across the world. So their funding isn't restricted just to the US. Um, and they're really big players um, in Parkinson's research. So um, hopefully 
our understanding of how the genetics is actually influencing Parkinson's disease really does make some massive leaps, leaps forward in the next five years or so. Okay, I've talked about risk factors. Um, I've got their risk mediation. So one of the things I think that the field doesn't do particularly well is talk about things or identify things that are actually protective against getting Parkinson's. I've got two up there, smoking and caffeine. A little controversial. I usually say smoking very quietly. But it is one of the most robust associations that has ever been found. So if you're a smoker, you're much less like likely to develop Parkinson's disease. If you've been an ex-smoker, you are less likely to get Parkinson's disease. If you have been exposed to secondhand cigarette smoke, you are less likely to get it. It's a bit of a dose-dependent um, you know, dose situation. So if you've smoked heavily for 40 years, you're probably sitting quite pretty at this stage. <laughs> I'm not advocating. <laughs> I am not advocating smoking it one bit. The, the interesting thing about this, we've known about it for a long time, but we don't know why. Nobody's been able to work out what the association actually is. At this point in time, it is just an association. It could be completely spurious. Could not, you know, maybe it means nothing. Interestingly, I actually just stumbled across a review this afternoon, uh, which was touching on this. And so most of the work that's been done is focused on nicotine, because that's obviously the, the thing that you would most likely think, um, but it hasn't come out with anything major. Um, so the review was really just calling for a reorientation of the research in this area um, and looking at some of the other factors. So the key thing is, is that although that association is there and it seems very robust, we still don't really understand what's happening. Um, and... We talk a little bit, um, you may have heard recently about this explosion in numbers of people that we expect to get Parkinson's disease, and some of that, people are saying, is because obviously a lot less people smoke now. Um, so I think it's a bit of a wait and see what happens there. I do think eventually one day we'll work out what's going on, but it is an odd association. The other one is caffeine, so if you drink coffee, you're probably doing okay. Um, this one, um, again, we don't necessarily know what's happening, but it's likely that the caffeine is, is actually reducing inflammation um, through known mechanisms, so that might be playing a role. The other thing that's happened more recently is that there have been a number of studies where they've looked at you know, big data sets of entire populations and they've looked at the medication that these people have used over time. And so a number of medications have been pulled out and um, and indicated that they reduce the risk, if you've used these over a period of time, they reduce the risk of getting Parkinson's later on. So the humble asthma inhaler, for one, um, glitazone medications for diabetes, uh, calcium channel blockers, which are used in hypertension, and Ambroxol, which is a cough syrup. So the calcium channel blockers, they've been through a clinical trial. It was not successful, unfortunately. Ambroxol's in a clinical trial now. So often what happens, I think we find when we look at these really big data sets, we find these associations and then we do a little bit of research and, you know, there is actually good scientific basis for why these medications might work, but then we try them in clinical trials and then they don't work. So there's something missing, um, and I'll touch on that again in, in a little bit. We have a PhD student, Christina, she's looking at the diabetes story. It's actually really interesting because diabetes itself is going to increase your risk of getting Parkinson's, but then the medications used to treat the diabetes can actually slow down or prevent the Parkinson's. So it's a little bit of a complicated story. Challenge number two, uh, which is kind of related to challenge number one, and that is can we identify who is going to get Parkinson's? So before we get to the point that you have some niggly little motor symptoms that you think are a little bit weird and you go to your doctor to see what's happening, can we identify who might be on the path much earlier on? So this is a timeline of Parkinson's. Um, these are all the different symptoms. This is time and years here. This is degree of disability. The key thing is this is diagnosis. So we're well along the path 
before we even get to the diagnosis. And you'll see this sort of bluey triangle, which is the motor symptoms, and they may be present for around five years before the diagnosis. But these non-motor symptoms of the green triangle, they can stretch out to 10, 15, or 20 years before the diagnosis. So there's a lot of work being done to identify people at this stage, which we consider to be early in the, in the pathological process of the disorder, because we think when we get those drugs that can stop the progression, slow the progression, or modify the course of the disease, they are probably going to have to be applied during this period. We can't wait till they get a diagnosis because we're really just too far down the line to do much about it. And that's probably why a lot of the clinical trials to date have actually failed, because we're getting people too late, because we can't enrol people in a clinical trial until they've got a diagnosis. So we need to shift um, to looking at this early stage. There's some ethical considerations, definitely. Um, there's no guarantee that someone who has constipation is going to go on to get Parkinson's. You know, most people experience it at some point in life. There's many different reasons why you might get chronic constipation. Same with depression and anxiety. Sometimes these are just normal aspects of ageing, so it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong. So there's a real push to, to find better ways to accurately identify who might be in these early stages. Okay, this is my take a drink of water slide. So those are just some famous people who have come out and acknowledged that they have Parkinson's disease. You'll notice many of the photos are of the much younger version of them. <laughs> I think the most Parkinsonian face is probably John Walker. Uh, and there's Michael J. Fox there. So he set up the Michael J. Fox Foundation and he's used, um, I guess, his celebrity status to raise hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, which has all gone directly towards um, Parkinson's research. Okay, challenge number three. And this is going to take a wee while. There's no diagnostic test. So when you go to the doctor to get your diagnosis, you have a physical examination, there's a medical history. It really comes down to clinical interpretation. You may get a brain scan, but that's really to rule out other things, not, not necessarily to confirm the diagnosis. So, first of all, right, the first one I'm going to talk about is really left field, and I love it. Right? This, is, this is where the big breakthroughs come, is things out of left field. This is Joy. Joy is a super sniffer, as I like to call her. So she's from Edinburgh, she's a retired nurse, uh, and her husband had uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, and Joy noticed that his smell changed. It didn't change at the time he got his diagnosis. In fact, it changed, I think it was up to 12 years beforehand that she noticed that his smell, you know, we all have a unique smell. His smell changed. They went down the line, he got the diagnosis. They started going to events like this. They started mingling with other people with the diagnosis and she was like, whoa, these people all smell the same. <laughs> it wasn't just her husband. In fact, all the people she met with Parkinson's smelled the same. It's described as a musty smell. I don't know. I think the key thing is, is that her sense of smell is off the charts, okay? It's much, much more sensitive than probably any of us in the room. They, she teamed up with some researchers anyway. Uh, they've trained some dogs to smell Parkinson's. It's very good. Um, and the scientists have been able to establish the molecular s signature of the scent, and it is, I think they've narrowed it down to four compounds. So this smell's just coming from the natural oils that the skin produces. I checked in last year at one point, and the scientists are now working with clinical laboratories to see how feasible it is to do this as a clinical test. Um, but she was very good. They gave her some T-shirts, right? Some, some Parkinson's, some non-Parkinson's. She got them all right. It was good. She misclassified one of the control T-shirts, um, but then that person went on to be diagnosed about eight months later. So her <laughs> sense of smell is unbelievable. And if this is if this what becomes our, our diagnostic test, I reckon that would be amazing. 
Uh, but normally, uh, diagnostic tests tend to try and follow the pathology of the disorder that they're trying to identify. Um, so Parkinson's has a couple of key pathologies. The first one I'm going to talk about is the death of the dopamine neurons, which are located in the substantia nigra. That sounds really scary. Uh, this is a brain, so remember our brains have two hemispheres which are locked together. If you cut down the middle and you separate those two hemispheres out and then you look on the cut surface, this is what you're going to see. Oh, wrong one. Right, so this is the cerebrum up the top, and the bit we're interested in is this bit down here. It's the brain stem, and at the top of the brain stem we have the midbrain, and that is where the substantia nigra is located. If you take a slice through there, you can see if the brain has Parkinson's or not. So this is a normal non-Parkinsonian brain, and it has a very dark line across here, and that's the substantia nigra. This is someone who had Parkinson's disease. You can still see the line, but it's not as dark as what you can see in this control brain here. So that's cool. We can see it with the naked eye. I can see it. You can see it. It's not very useful for Mr. Brown, who just got his diagnosis. Mm -hmm because he still needs his brain. So you would think we've got lots of fancy technology to image our brain. Hands up, who's had an MRI scan on any part of the body? Must be a few knees and hips in here that have been imaged. Hands up, who's had one of their brain? Yeah, a few, probably in our study, maybe. Um, so you would think that we would be able to just pop you in an MRI scanner and we would be able to tell if you've got Parkinson's or not hasn't quite worked out that way, but there's been lots of different sort of theories put forward or ways of identifying it, and I do like this one. It's called the swallowtail sign. Uh, so you can obviously see, this one's quite good too, because you can see a normal and an abnormal in the same person. Um, and that fits with how the disorder develops. So it develops on one side first only. Um, so they obviously got this person fairly early on in the disease process. And if you squint and tilt your head to the side, you'll see a black blob here and then two little tails coming out. Maybe it looks like a swallowtail. I'm not sure. I think radiologists are on a different planet when they look at shades of grey. But So this is a normal uh, substantia nigra, and this is an abnormal one, so just big black blobby mess. It hasn't really taken off. So... One of the problems is, is that because the substantia nigra is so deep in the brain, um, it's just difficult to image and to get a good quality image because even that looks pretty grainy, right? So it hasn't really taken off. It doesn't mean that we're not going to get, you know, revisit this and that some fancy algorithm's not going to be developed that's going to be able to do this automatically for us and we're not going to have to rely on the naked eye. Um, one of the other ways um, that we can look at the substantia nigra um, is through a, a different type of imaging, and this comes from my um, colleague Tracy Mauser. This is called quantitative susceptibility mapping. We like to call it QSM, and what it does is it measures iron in the brain. So this is a control brain, so this is from a control participant. Um, the substantia nigra, maybe, if you can see that, is labelled, uh, drawn around in green. And there's another structure called the red nucleus, which is the circular bit. They're naturally quite high in iron anyway, because they're showing up quite bright compared to the rest of the brain tissue. This here is from someone with Parkinson's disease, and I think, again, if you squint your eyes and tilt your head to the other side, you can probably determine that that substantia nigra is brighter than this one here. So there is more iron deposition in the substantia nigra in someone with Parkinson's disease. Um, but again, I'm not sure why. This hasn't really taken off in terms of diagnostic tests, probably because we're still talking about shades of grey. There is one form of imaging that is used and is accepted. Um, it's, it's a form of nuclear imaging, so now we're talking about having radioactively labelled traces injected into the bloodstream. You wait a wee while because you've got to wait for it to get to the brain, and then it attaches to its target in the brain. And here what it's attaching to is the dopamine transporter, and that's located on the axons of the dopamine neuron, so not in the substantia nigra anymore because it obviously sends its axons up to other parts of the brain. And in this one here, which is a normal brain, we see the outline of a structure which we call the putamen, which looks like that. It's got that weird sort of shape to it. 
So that's good, right? There's good coverage of the traces throughout the whole structure. This one is from someone with a Parkinsonian syndrome. They've clearly lost a little bit of their innovation there, haven't they? We can't see the full extent of the structure here. We've just got a little, couple of little hot spots. Um, so I think it depends on what country you're in as to how regularly this gets used. Um, it's not used, well, it's not used widely in New Zealand because it's not available widely. Um, but it is available in Christchurch. Um, but it's not used on a routine basis, either clinically, or we don't use it in research either, mainly because the scans cost over $3,000 each. Um, but it is used if there's still some queries around whether it's Parkinson's or not. Um, and that's where the tremor might be a little too much like an essential tremor. So sometimes you can do this to show whether or not you've, the person's lost their dopamine um, axons or not. And if someone's been on um, antipsychotic medication for an extended period of time, they may also start displaying some motor symptoms which are very much like Parkinson's disease. So sometimes you can do um, the scan to differentiate between um, actually a pathological cause um, for those um, symptoms or whether it's perhaps just a result of their medication use. Okay. Now, the other key pathology that Parkinson's is associated with is what we call Lewy bodies. Um, so this is just a schematic of a neuron, and it's got this big Lewy body. Um, it sits in the cell body, and this is what it looks like when you look under a microscope. Uh, and within those Lewy bodies, we have alpha-synuclein protein, and you may have heard of alpha-synuclein. It's the protein that we know that goes a little bit astray in Parkinson's disease. So I guess the question is, why don't we just image that? Surely we can measure that in some way. So let's consider brain imaging. And here we're talking about PET imaging, so positron emission tomography. Again, it's a radioactively labelled tracer popped into the bloodstream. Wait a while, it gets up to the brain. There have been some massive efforts to develop this a viable tracer. And the Michael J. Fox Foundation I think they had a $10 million donation from a single person that has been put towards this, and the foundation itself have put in some extra um, few million as well. Um, and just last year, we had some publications um, which came out showing um, the tracer not only in sort of monkeys and animals uh, and post-mortem tissue, but also um, in live uh, people. And so this shows uh, the brain at two different levels. Um, obviously, there's a number of disorders up there, so we've got healthy controls, dementia with Lewy bodies, MSA, which comes in two forms, a C and a P, uh, and then Parkinson's disease. Uh, and the key thing here is that these three disorders all share pathology. So they all lose, um, or they all have alpha synuclein protein, which is going astray, okay? Um, and that's why these three are, are included here. So this group's from Sweden. As far as I could tell, uh, they developed the tracer as well, uh, and they definitely had some funding from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, and the key takeaway from theirs is seems to be, does it really well, because we're looking at these red hotspots, really well at distinguishing MSA from their other disorders. And it may just be that their tracer that they've developed inadvertently likes the MSA version of alpha nuclein above the others. Um, so we wait to see um, how far that gets. Um, the tracer doesn't have a really cool name yet. It's still just um, a series of letters and numbers, but hopefully if it gets to market, it'll get quite a cool name. Um, so we can do this. We've been doing this with Alzheimer's disease for quite a while. Beta amyloid, you know, that's the protein that goes astray. We have PET imaging that, that um, can look at the beta amyloid. So it, it's been frustrating, I think, for the Parkinson's community that we've had to wait so long to get a tracer um, for the alpha-synuclein protein. But there must be other ways that we can measure it, right? Blood. Blood has everything, yeah? Something's wrong, you go to the doctor, you get sent for a blood test. Uh, That's simple. We're all familiar with them. They're relatively well tolerated. Sure, people don't like needles, but you look away, you're generally okay. Uh, it's been tried, believe me, <laughs> but the alpha-synuclein concentration in blood is quite low, so that poses a little bit of a challenge. Um, red blood cells also have alpha-synuclein, 
Um, in fact, it's been estimated that 99% of the alpha-synuclein in blood comes from red blood cells. So the question is then, how relevant is it to measure alpha-synuclein in the blood if we know that most of it's coming from a red blood cell and not from the brain? So the blood test hasn't really taken off so much, but um, us, along with a few other people, uh, thought we would be a bit sneaky and would try and beat those red blood cells in their alpha-synuclein. And we looked at EVs within the blood. And I'm not suggesting that there's a convoy of Teslas floating around in our bloodstream, but what we do have in our bloodstream is extracellular vesicles. And those are little sacs of protein which are excreted by all cells in our body. But what you're able to do is you're able to identify what cell type they come from. So we teamed up with a group of um, researchers at the National Institute of Aging in the US. So this is Demetrius and this is Marja. And a uh, big shout out to Joe. He's the lead author on this paper, but I couldn't find a mugshot of him online. Um, we sent our plasma samples, which we have stored in the freezer. We sent them over to the US. They uh, have expertise in identifying the EVs that have been secreted by the neurons. And then uh, you can bust those EVs open and you can measure the protein concentration on the inside. And this is what we came out with. It's not a pretty slide, I can tell you that. But when you do the statistics, on average, the PDs had a lower concentration than the controls. When you split the PD group into those with normal cognition and those with some cognitive impairment, uh, the cognitive impairment group, again, had lower. But I think the takeaway message is that the spread of dots on there that's not going to be useful for a diagnostic test, right? There's no natural cut-off cut point. So although we thought we were actually beating the red blood cells, in fact, I think the technology that we were using, the standard assay to measure the alpha-synuclein, just probably wasn't up to scratch. And we've had a bit of a breakthrough there. So this is the title of a commentary, Quaking Our Way which is a good pun, which you'll, I'll explain in a minute, uh, to a Parkinson's biomarker breakthrough in 2023. And it's in relation to this paper, which came out in May. So a new type of assay to measure alpha-synuclein. Um, they've called it alpha-synuclein seed amplification. It's also called RT-quick, or real-time quaking. That's why I like that there. Um, uh, now I've forgotten what it was, quaking, quaking induced conversion. Sorry, I forgot, <laughs> forgot what the acronym was. Now the key thing here, I think, is that this paper got so much attention because it used the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative, or PPMI as we like to call it. That's funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, big multi-site, originally in the States, now um, across the world, they used over a 1,000 samples in that study, so the confidence that we now have in those results is quite high because they've actually done all the work for us. We don't need to wait five years for enough people to redo that study to be, to be confident, but it's CSF, right? So that's, they measured it in CSF, so the fluid that's around the outside of the brain. These guys used skin tissue, so that's cool, but who's going to volunteer to get a lumbar puncture or a skin biopsy done just for a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, I probably would, to be fair. But the key thing is, is just a month later in June, these guys published a, a paper using serum, which of course is blood. So I think what we're going to find, if I did this talk again in 12 months' time, the actual number of papers that have come out using the, that technique will have exploded substantially. Now, the key thing here is these authors did acknowledge the low concentration of alpha-synuclein has been a problem. There's an intermediate step that they had to do, but I think we can probably overcome that. And the key thing about this assay is it's not actually measuring the concentration of alpha-synuclein anymore, it's measuring the behaviour of alpha-synuclein. So one of the key things about alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's is that it becomes sticky and therefore can't do its job properly. And what it does is it can transfer that behaviour, that stickiness, from one piece of protein to another. 
And what this assay does is it measures the sample's ability to do that. So effectively what it does is you put in some synthetic alpha-synuclein and you chuck your sample in from Mr Brown, who's got just had his diagnosis, and then you see if that sample can actually induce aggregation in that synthetic um, alpha-synuclein. So it's not relying on concentration, it's measuring behaviour, which is kind of a quite a different way of thinking about it. Um, so hopefully that will move things forward quite quickly just in the next year or two. And I guess in parallel to this, some people were like, yeah, blood's not great for alpha synuclein, so let's think of something else. And lo and behold, tears have become a key focus for some groups. And we've got some collaborators from the University of Canterbury here who are, are looking into this. So it's sort of alternate to blood and therefore it eliminates that red blood cell problem. Um, advocates of tears will, will say that it's non-invasive, uh, it's easier to collect, and it's perhaps more suitable for regular collection so that we can do it on a regular basis and we can track people over time. So uh, what it is, is a wee diagram which I borrowed from Wikipedia. Uh, there's just a little strip of paper, get, you just fold the end over, you pop it into just under the eyelid, um, and the irritation that it causes will naturally cause your eye to produce tears, and then the paper soaks up the tears, and then you <coughs> can elute the tears from the paper into buffer later on and measure it. Um, so our colleagues are using, looking at tears. Uh, Jemima is part of her PhD. She's furiously collecting samples at the moment. They're going to use their RT quick assay to, to measure this, so hopefully... Um, uh, we'll get some results in the next month or so from here. Oh, no, wrong one. There we go. Right, so I just wanted to quickly touch on biomarkers. I haven't, I haven't talked about biomarkers too much, but that's really what, when I'm talking about how to measure um, alpha-synuclein, that's really what I'm talking about. So a good biomarker is going to help you diagnose the condition. So it'll be useful in diagnosis. A really good biomarker will change with the progression of the disorder so that it can tell you something about the stage at which the person's at in the process. And it will change in response to therapy so that a good biomarker will be able to use to test new therapies um, that we develop in the future. So some challenges have been overcome. So I think this new assay for alpha-synuclein, where we're measuring the behaviour rather than the concentra concentration, I think is really good from the diagnostic point of view. But that's it. It gives you a yes or a no answer to whether or not that sample is able to induce that aggregation of the alpha-synuclein. So it's good for diagnosis. It's unclear, and I'm struggling to, to envisage how it would actually work in terms of progression over time, because I think once you've got alpha-synuclein that is able to clump together, it's very difficult to get rid of it. And that behaviour is unlikely to change as the disorder goes on. So we're, we're part way there, but we're not all the way there. And the other thing which I've sort of alluded to is there is Parkinsonian disorders as a group, which actually is three, as we know it now, three different disorders. So how do you differentiate between disorders that share pathology? Um, so again, the alpha-synuclein behaviour, measuring that, is telling you one thing, but it's, not t it's telling you that there's a Parkinsonian disorder there. It's not telling you which version it is. So there's going to have to be another step which helps differential um, diagnosis between those related disorders. And I think they can do that. Um, I think there's sort of uh, structural differences between the alpha-synuclein, bet you know, between the different disorders. So I think that will come in time as well. So although we make it, we've made some big leaps forward in our knowledge just in the last 12 months, I think the next two years will be quite exciting to see where this field goes. But we are still perhaps just a little way off getting something that is widely accepted, A, by the research community and then by the clinical community in terms of um, a test. But I think there is hope there. And I'm just, I, I was told that if the food comes in, I've probably talked for too long. Um, Going by my time, I probably not too bad. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to finish off. Uh, there's obviously a really big team of researchers at NZBRI. Not everyone got a face on the slide, um, but there's lots of people involved um, in all that work that I put up there. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Tony. That was um, mind-blowing. I'm sure we're all sitting there going, I've got that, that, but maybe not that. So, you know. We would love the opportunity. There's two microphones that are going to be passed around. If you've got any questions, throw them um, your hand up, and then Tony will do her best to answer them. <laughs> yeah. So who's going to be brave to put their hand up first? Wonderful. Hello. Oh, it's on. Oh, hello. Um, so you were talking there about the risk factors, and you're talking about smoking there. Do you think vaping's going to play, put a spanner in the works? Potentially. Oh, am I on? I'm not on. Am I on? I'm on now. Uh, yeah, vaping is, yeah, that's a good point. Um, <clears throat> if it's nicotine, I guess there's still the potential for vaping to be protective in the future if you're vaping a nicotine product. Um, if it's something else within the mix that we find in cigarettes or something about the smoke generated during the smoking process, uh, then no, vaping's probably not going to have the same effect. But that's, that's just a, I, I don't know a lot about the ins and outs of cigarette smoke and its potential. <laughs> but yeah, so I'd say probably not, unless it's nicotine. Oh, yeah, no, I don't recommend it. <laughs> I don't recommend it at all. <laughs> okay, so has there been any research done into marijuana? It's a good question, and I, I mean, yes, there has. Um, I don't know the field, um, but there are obviously... Um, Issues around, um, you know, if, if you're in a country where it's illegal to have marijuana and stuff, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, so I think, you know, the sort of the CBD oil and things like that is probably um, perhaps the way to go uh, where you can. Um, I think anecdotally, um, people um, like it for pain in particular. Um, and some people advocate um, for benefits with tremor. Um, I don't know that the science is there to really back that up at this point. It is something that I've considered that we, maybe we should try. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it is difficult to, to do those sorts of studies. Yeah. Down the back corner. Um, we've talked about diagnosis, but um, in terms of the medications, mm -hmm. um, do they show any signs of replacing dopamine in the brain, or do they just have the effect of assisting things like tremor and gait? <clears throat> yep, so um, levodopa is the primary um, medication used for treatment, uh, and levodopa is the precursor to dopamine. Um, so we give levodopa because it's able to get across the blood brain barrier, which dopamine is not. And also dopamine's obviously um, utilised by other parts of the body, so you don't want dopamine to be acting in the periphery. You, we really only want it in the central nervous system. So we, we give levodopa. Once it gets into the brain, it's then converted into dopamine, so we are replacing dopamine with levodopa. Um, some of the other medications um, work at the receptors, so it's, it's tr almost tricking the brain into thinking that dopamine's there when it's not. Um, and then some of the other medications act on um, other, other chemical pathways that are related to the dopamine system, but not directly the dopamine system. So what determines what kind of medication you would be um, administering to patients? Um, basically, you get levodopa. <laughs> uh, as a starting point. It's changed over time. When I first um, started in Parkinson's research, um, you know, it, we were still at the point where uh, the, the medication to trick the receptors, that was often used initially, um, but I think people have sort of, you know, the, the field's moved on, so people really do just start on the um, levodopa first um, in, in most cases. Um, and then the other medications tend to get added in over time as different symptoms sort of come and go and things like that. Um, if we had something that could replace levodopa, I think a lot of people would be happy. Um, but uh, at this point in time, that's, that's the best we've got. Yeah, it's, the microphone's just coming your way. 
Thank you. For 20 years, I was diagnosed as having essential tremor. Mm -hmm. um, in retrospect, it looks as though either that was wrong or the two were operating together yeah. or one mutated into the other. And a specialist I saw in Sydney said there is some debate as to whether a mutation can occur. Yeah. I just wonder if you have any comment. Yeah, it's not something I know too much about, but um, I think having a central tremor can slightly increase the risk of then developing Parkinson's in the future. Um, whether it's, it mutates into Parkinson's or whether you end up with the two side by side, um, I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, um, there are sometimes, um, you know, and maybe you'd be a good candidate for that for that nuclear imaging where we'd, you know, be able to see perhaps 20 years ago or maybe even 10 years ago to see what was going on and whether it was a true essential tremor or whether you, in fact, had some of that pathology. But, yeah. I think that's it by the looks of things. Um, the good news is... Tony's going to be here um, to share some kai food and a cup of tea. So if something comes to mind, please come over, have a chat. I would love to talk to anyone who's interested in creating more talented scientists like Tony here, who, because of her Miller Scholarship, which was through a generous gift and will supporters, that her career's come so far. So if you're feeling inspired, please grab a pamphlet, which is all about leaving gifts in your will, or there's an opportunity to make a koha, a donation, um, in these self-addressed envelopes um, to keep backing the incredible work that you're doing. So thank you so much, Tony. We'll give you a round of applause. There's also two amazing resources I have here. This is, uh, Ross wrote a story about his uh, journey with Parkinson's and still getting out on the white bait net. So you can buy that book. So come and see me if you're interested in purchasing that. And there's a couple of copies I think that might be here this evening um, with people, which is Grandma's Brain. And that's talking about uh, a lady who's been diagnosed and how she's explaining to her mokapuna, her grandchildren, about the progression of the disease. So if you grab one of these copies, feel free to make it the gift that keeps on giving and pass it around, especially to anyone who may find it useful um, for their little ones. So thank you for coming this evening and um, we look forward to seeing you all again. Tina kato katoa. Thank you.